Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, September 8th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Uh, our first item on the agenda is a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their name. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. All right, welcome back everybody um, to a new school year. I hope everybody had a good start to the year. Um, our next item on the agenda is public participation. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. Dr. Allison Ampey, our vice chair, will be the timer and will give the speaker a signal when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy, BEDH, that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak in person or via Zoom, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 3 p.m. on the date of the meeting. Um, we have two um, public participation um, this evening, our first is um, Ms. Perez. Yes. Welcome. So if you want to just um, move up to one of these chairs and speak into the microphone, please. So I didn't realize that we had three minutes. Mm -hmm. So I did not three, three minutes worth of presentation. Uh, is that that's the strict number? Just yes. Okay. Yep. If you have it in writing, we'll take it and read it. And so I think you, you did send us some documents, mm -hmm. right? I sent you, yes, I sent yep. you a supplement to to um, which we can actually, yes, perhaps we do this. Yeah, that. so we'll, we will, some of us have probably looked at it already and the rest of us will take a look at it um, as soon as possible, but okay. um, just in the interest of keeping our meeting moving, of um, we can give you three minutes right okay. now. Okay. Um, well, I'll just do my best to condense. <laughs> and practice my speed reading. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Eliza Perez and I grew up in the area. My husband and I are the parents of two APS students. Uh, my background includes teaching science as well as curriculum development. I'm also a member of Safer Air, Safer Schools, a group of parents and community members who are dedicated to helping our school community stay safe in this pandemic and beyond. We've sent various communications to stakeholders and decision makers such as yourself um, however, those communications have been ignored. So therefore, I would like to take a bit of your time to discuss uh, several important topics, including long COVID, how long COVID impacts equity here in town and what we need to do to fix this. So I'm just gonna jump right ahead and give you the punchline. Um, we need consistency in mitigations with oversight. We need to do more to put equity first and to do this by re reducing transmission. And for the numbers folks here, we need to think about how all of this impacts the operations of the district. A lot has changed last year. We lost all of our mitigations, except for the air filters. And just like how our, our mitigations have changed, so did they, our understanding by scientists about how COVID is transmitted and what it does to your body. We know that it's airborne. We know that masks help. We know that consistently open windows and consistent filtration help. We also know that long COVID is real and does leave lingering symptoms ranging from mild and temporary too long lasting and downright disabling. Both, lot, both adults and children get long COVID. Um, public health tells us not to worry that COVID is, long COVID is rare, but a rare disease is considered rare if it's 
if less than 200,000 people are affected. However, as of March, 23 million Americans have been affected by long COVID, many of whom live in this town, including adults and our own children. So all of this long COVID and all of this chronic illness uh, brings me next to our to discuss equity, which seems a little disjointed, but we know what equity is. It's a big thing that we all talk about, especially in our schools. Um, but a big part of equity includes health access and health outcomes. Marginalized groups also include folks for whom their health conditions, which includes long COVID now, put them at a disadvantage to their peers. Now, health, public health and schools have made tremendous progress to account for that with wheelchair ramps and peanut allergy protocols and such and so forth, uh, all designed to prevent ableism and to not exclude folks with medical conditions from being safe at school, because when you are safe at school, you can access education and your world becomes brighter. But now there's a new barrier, which is long COVID. And it's not rare. 40 million Americans have long COVID. It is, it is uh, in, are out of work at this time. So kids are at a disadvantage if they have long COVID. If they have, someone has brain damage, they can't exactly perform at optimal levels needed to learn. If someone is fatigued nonstop, it's hard to pay attention. Uh, it's exhaustion on a cellular level, and it's actually caused by neuroinflammation. Ms. Perez, it's time to, to finish up, please. Okay, so long COVID is bad. We want to reduce it. I included some um, a, a supplement with proposals from our group, Safer Air, Safer Schools, that we ask that you please consider uh, in the name of equity. And then in, in finally, all of these tools that I gave you are, avail are available, all within grasp and attainable. We know this because it's being done in different districts across the country and the world, and we do not need the blessing of the CDC or DESE or anyone else but you to make this happen. The best time to throw what we've got at this problem was in the past. The next best time is now, it's today. We cannot allow policy to be guided by special interests or politics, but rather science. In Virginia, the Federal Court of Appeals just voted to uphold the rights of students at risk for severe COVID disease to have accommodations made so they can Perez, attend I need, school safety. I need you to finish up, please. Okay. In Arlington, we can do for marginalized groups and vulnerable families what Virginia was unwilling. We do not and will not accept the preventable illness and disability of children and their families in Arlington. And children cannot individual responsibility their way through this pandemic. That is our job. We are the adults and you are the adults with the decision-making power. So I thank you for your time and in advance for the thought and consideration that you will offer our solutions that we present to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Ms. Leary and I believe she's on the Zoom. Um, Ms. Ms. Dickens, are you able to make her? Hi, I'm here. Hi, can, don't start yet because we want to, can we make her the big, <laughs> the big screen? Yeah. Speaker view. Speaker view. That's a... <laughs> but that's the better way of doing it. Okay. No, that's, thank you. No, no, that's I think when she starts talking, she'll go. Will it go? Okay. Yeah. Miss Larry, can am you I... just say something? So, yeah. yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Am I supposed to start? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Hi, my, my name, name is Kate Leary. Leary. I'm at 39, 39 Milton Street. Um, my son is a freshman at Arlington High School, so that this was his um, third day of school at Arlington High School. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of option two um, for the high school building project decision that you're that you're going to be discussing tonight. Um, I think that. 11 days of half days for students is a lot. It's a lot of lost time on learning. Um, I think it would be a very rough start to the school year, particularly for freshmen. I'm, I'm watching my son try to adjust right now and it's, it's everyone is, you know, being really friendly and helpful, but it's no joke trying to get around that building. Um, and it seems like it would also have a significant impact on lab students. Um, so I think that I urge the committee to, to choose to spend the contingency money to keep FUSCO online for longer so that students can go back to school for full days next September. Um, I think, 
you know, I will support um, option two regardless, but I, I do have a bunch of questions that I'm hoping, I'm sure many of you have the same questions, so I'm eager to hear the conversation. Um, but I'm wondering what's the plan for students if BUSCO is demolished in June and there are further delays, that's very common right now. Um, I also think that I really hope that there are real price tags attached to option one. Um, before a vote happens in this committee. I think there's a hidden cost um, that with the half day plan, we're paying for a lot of educator instructional time that doesn't get delivered to students. And I'd like to see a dollar figure attached to that. Um, there's a TBD for outfitting temporary lab classrooms and modulars for athletics and um, ACE. And the last time we looked into this as a town, modulars were very costly. Um, another thing that I think is important to consider is that the plan that was presented by the building committee to voters was a phased plan that did not require modulars and didn't have significant learning interruptions for students. That was really important to me as a voter and as someone who worked with many of you on the YES campaign. Um, I think this kind of interruption would have been a problem for voters. And as you know, as we all know, the town will be going back to voters soon for an operating override. Um, I think that this 11 day plan, um, if it really is 11 days for sure, is a significant interruption. Um, you know, and I think that maybe not a lot of people are paying attention to this issue now, but they they will be when when they find out their kids are going to school for half days if, if option one is chosen. Um, I really want to thank you for your work and your thoughtful consideration. I know many of you are on the building committee and that the school committee has been part of these conversations for a long time. I understand it's a very long and complex, okay, that's my own timer, so I'll stop myself. It's a long and complex project and that financial concerns and responsibility are very important, um, but I think it's important to be educationally responsible too. And Ms. I Mary, hope that if you, you, oh, if you, if you can finish up, please, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I hope you choose, choose option two because I think it's really the right decision for Arlington students. Thank you for listening. Um, just for the public commenters, um, we don't respond um, to the public comment, but it might come up later on in our discussion. It might get referred to a subcommittee. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, opening day and summer activities report, Dr. Holman and Dr. McNeil. All right, give me one second. I will drive slides, um, but you're starting. Um, hold on. So we're pleased to bring you a report on some of the things that we have been up to this summer. This is not a comprehensive report. We will have more to say about some of the professional development that happened this summer when we do the PD report, but that doesn't happen until the very end of the school year. So we wanted to give you a little bit of information about some of the work that happened, the curriculum work that happened during the summer. Dr. McNeil will do that and then he'll pass it off to me to do a um, report on some of our opening activities as we got the year started. It's been a great start to the year and it has been absolutely wonderful to see students and we're looking forward to sharing a little bit about what we've been up to over the summer. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so first before I begin, oh, I've been out of practice. <laughs> um, so first before I begin, I just would like to thank all of the teachers, coaches, curriculum leaders and directors who spent time and building administrators um, across the district who spent time over the summer just engaging in conversations about curriculum, uh, attending special, I mean, uh, professional learning sessions after this year. It was, uh, as we know that this past year, even though we, I say we were still in the pandemic, it was still a very uh, taxing time for our teachers and just for them to give up their time over the summers, just very appreciative. So um, as we go to our first slide, I just, some of the themes that you'll see in all of the summer work that was completed uh, just uh, revolved around developing curriculum, updating curriculum, um, trying to make curriculum more inclusive of different groups of students, uh, and also attending professional development. So uh, some of the things I'm gonna highlight, some of the things I'm, I'm not gonna mention, but you'll see, you can read about them on the different slides. So 
The first thing I want to highlight is we had 15 teachers take the ideas uh, one course, which focuses on anti-racist school practices to support the success, the success for all students. So that was something that we offer throughout the year for the last three or four years. And so I'm really proud to say that I think we have over 100 teachers or staff throughout our district have taken this course. And it's uh, very intensive, it's 25 hours and they can get two graduate credits through Framingham State University. Uh, the second thing I wanna highlight is the work that our, um, uh, that Deb Perry, our curriculum director did with the ninth grade English teachers where they uh, came together for five days and planned um, and participated in special learning for our heterogeneous uh, pilot at the ninth grade uh, level, uh, ninth grade English. So, um, you know, that was a very successful and I heard nothing but good things from that. And then we will come back to report uh, on the progress of that at, at a later time at another school committee meeting. Uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, another thing I would like to highlight is the work uh, completed by our history social studies team. First, I would like to highlight that we have a new social studies director, uh, Caitlin Moran, who has come right in and hit the ground running. Um, she's done a fabulous job connecting with teachers, other curriculum leaders, and just learning the culture of Arlington. So uh, you will meet her. I will have her come in and you can meet her as we uh, have um, at, our, at our future meetings. And so some of the work we did here is like updating curriculum, again, bringing in uh, diverse perspectives, looking at uh, instructional materials. And uh, so you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we've done with our history and social studies. And I wanna emphasize that we have not adopted a canned curriculum. This is all cultivating, curating different resources. And so we're, we're actually developing this curriculum of K through 12 uh, you know, at the district level. So I'm very proud of that work. Uh, we can go to yep. the next slide. Um, so I also wanna highlight our K-5 teachers who attended professional learning sessions, uh, focusing on instructional practice, uh, Turk, which is the uh, curriculum that we have, the, the res curriculum resource we use at the kindergarten through fifth grade level, or actually first through fifth grade level. They uh, attended these sessions and uh, you can see the different topics that the workshops focused on. And, and they were all online and they were asynchronous and synchronous. So um, really happy and proud of that work that we've done and uh, with our math teachers at that level. Uh, looking at SEL, um, we had teachers and I wanna highlight the work that Sarah Bird has done to uh, uh, apply for and receive grants. And some of those grants, you can see how we utilized it for professional learning. We had our K-5 staff participate in a responsive classroom for the, at the basic, for the basic and advanced levels. And then we had our middle school teachers also attend as well. And you can also see that our K-12 through staff participated in grant funded training um, to get sort to become certified youth mental health uh, first aid instructions and then instructors and then we had some of our current instructors uh, also participate to become recertified. So moving along. And then um, I'm going to also ask uh, Allison Elmer to also talk about this, but we had 14 special education teachers and three reading teachers attended the Orton Gillingham training and uh, Allison can talk about the further training that's gonna take place uh, with those special education teachers. Sure, so they completed the uh, training portion and then there's a year long practicum that is supervised by um, the Orton Gillingham providers. So they will be completing that this year so that they will have their um, called level one practitioner certification, I believe is the official term, but they'll, they'll be doing that this school year. Absolutely. They'll be doing that this school year to get the practicum to get their certification. So they, re they had the initial course in the summer and then they're going to proceed and become certified by going and, and uh, going through the practicum, taking the pr practicum throughout the year. So that is something that I'm very proud of, yes. Is this something that they'll act as lead teachers for other people to support them? No, uh, Orrin Gillingham is a specific um, rules-based reading curriculum. So th they're getting trained to deliver that curriculum. Thank you. Right. Um, so moving along, uh, I'm gonna jump to the next slide. 
So that, that concludes the work that we've done. And like I said, those are some of the things I wanted to highlight. And then you can read about the other things. And then I, can, I also have a more comprehensive list um, that we have that I can also share with you a whole spreadsheet. Um, that talks about all the other things that were not in the slide deck that was accomplished over the summer. So we had, uh, we did a, a we, I, I feel like we had a, a healthy, robust, um, uh, you know, curriculum development and uh, uh, professional learning practice, things that we wanted to uh, accomplish over the summer. And I feel like we accomplished most of what we set out to do. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> talking about our new teacher orientation. Um, we had, uh, you see there uh, during August 22nd through the 25th and the 29th, we had approximately seven new staff participate in new staff orient, uh, orientation and training. And I also wanna highlight the work that Marie Janiak, our outgoing um, um, uh, mentor coordinator who pretty much organized this, structured it. Uh, she did a fabulous job uh, handing it off to our new um, mentor coordinators at the K-5 level. We have Dory Pazu, how do you say Paluzzi. that? Paluzzi. And then we have at the secondary level, we have Melissa Heath. So they came in and uh, they worked with Maria, uh, Marie, um, excuse me, Marie to understand, you know, the, the culture around this and understand that there are different things that they would have to accomplish. And again, they hit the ground running. And so I feel like we had a successful week with our new staff. They also have new ideas of how they wanna transform this um, week and continue to have it evolve to be more uh, effective and uh, productive for our new staff as we onboard them onto, uh, into the uh, Arlington culture. And so I don't know if uh, Mr. Spiegel would like to say anything else about this week. I mean, it was a busy week. It was uh, moving from Arlington High School to Gibbs and thank the staff and Custodial staff and IT staff at both uh, at both schools for the help that they gave, and food service for providing some of the snacks for the the new teachers. But um, it's a lot in a short amount of time, and so as uh, Dr. McNeil said, uh, um, Melissa and Dory are thinking of ways that maybe it can be structured a little differently in the future. It's it's a great M Marie Janiak had a great baseline for, for how we do this, and we've had we've been recognized in Arlington for our orientation and mentoring program, and we just wanna continuously improve it. Yeah, thank you for that. And so you can click on the, I, I included the uh, link to the agenda for the week, and you can see, <laughs> I know that they're overwhelmed about the amount of information that they received, uh, cause it, we had our curriculum leaders present on their different content areas. We had, they also met with their mentors, and we also had uh, special education and, uh, uh, Ms. Thomas, our DEI director, also presents. So you can see that. And um, if you have any questions, that ends my part of the presentation. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what leadership's been up to as we launched the year. We had a successful August leadership workshop um, that was entitled Learning and Leading Together in Pursuit of Growth, Joy, and Equity for all of our students. And the objectives are there, I won't read them to you. We did a little bit of pre-reading of a book by Dr. Jill Harrisonberg, who does a lot of work on shared leadership um, and teacher leadership in schools. And she actually planned the whole thing with me and then called me the night before and told me she had a family emergency. And so um, we had to pivot quickly and uh, Margaret was a great help. And um, we facilitated a fantastic three days of leadership workshop um, time together. We had a lot more participants this year than we've had in past years. There were over 115 people at this, um, which is over 10% of our organization. And we really wanted to make sure that we had our teacher leaders at the table. And it was absolutely wonderful having them there, helping us plan how we were going to lead into the school year. Um, I do want to make sure we acknowledge the Arlington Education Foundation because they supported um, a, in a somewhat last minute ask, they were extremely supportive of uh, providing some teacher leadership stipends to support the expanded participation in leadership workshop this year um, and to support the instructional leadership teamwork that we're gonna be doing at the schools during the year. So that was very much appreciated. Uh, opening day themes um, were that we were really sort of uh, focused on establishing sense of belonging for adult learners in APS. That was what I focused my opening remarks on, um, taking a look at a little bit of data that shows that we could work on this aspect of our diversity, belonging, equity, and inclusion work. And uh, we really wanted to think about 
how we were setting the stage for individual and collective um, district and school actions for the 2023-24 school year. Um, some of those actions that we've been thinking about, they're not listed there, but the ones that I talked to the team about, actually they're listed here, uh, were making sure that we establish and practice school-based shared instructional leadership on our instructional leadership teams, um, ensuring that we're establishing opportunities for all of our educators to engage in sustained choice-based professional learning. Dr. McNeil will have updates on what that's going to look like later, but he's been collecting proposals and putting together a menu of courses that teachers will be able to select what they want to learn about uh, tied to the district themes and the actions that we're taking. So we're really looking forward to trying that out and seeing how it goes. We'll be continuing our instructional rounds by administrative teams this year and really practicing having sustained engagement and conversations with our community about the equity work that we're doing in the system that will start this fall with conversations um, with the community with uh, that myself and Ms. Thomas will facilitate, focus on the strategic planning work that we're doing and asking for community input and engagement with our new district vision and mission statements and our four priorities. So we're really looking forward to launching that. And I believe that that's my last slide. All right, so we'll take any questions that anybody has about the launch of the year. Well, thank you very much. It was, I mean, the amount of things that happened over the summer in our school system um, is tremendous. And so it's important for, for us and for the community to see what all the work that you all are doing um, in July and August. So thank you for sharing that. All right, our next um, item on the agenda is an update and discussion on school and district logos. So uh, as part of the new website, there's been some logo and branding going on. And so the ask um, tonight, Dr. Homan's gonna share some of the logos with us and she's looking for feedback on the logos and also feedback on the process for how we might want to solicit feedback from stakeholders other than the seven of us and the administrative team um, in making a decision about what these logos will look like. And I think you're going to share this, but these are logos that will go on the website, on letterhead. Mm -hmm. That's part of your yes. share. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm also going to try to do some differentiation because I think we have we have a branding update to give you for Arlington High School that's linked to the building project. And if there are any questions on that, I know Dr. Jenger can take them. He's on Zoom with us. And then there's the feedback piece, which is the APS branding that I'm looking for community input on. The AHS branding is determined because that went through the building committee process. And I just wanted to make sure that that was in front of all of you and that you knew that that had happened. Um, so we did logo development for the AHS building project. Um, I want to distinguish between the logo that we're using on things like perhaps t-shirts, um, letterheads, and a mascot, which is still an ongoing conversation. There hasn't been a determination about what the high school mascot's going to be. We're just talking about the logo tonight. Um, and I'm letting you know that the logo and, logo and seal that was decided on um, by the interior subcommittee of the building committee is going to be used on the phase two gym floor and scoreboards. And then I want to talk about um, the logo and branding development for APS, which is a separate process, which is about what we put on district level um, walls in central office, for example, we're working on putting a logo um, emblem on one of the walls in the new central office building, but also on district letterhead on the district website. So these are the AHS logos that were approved by the interior subcommittee of the building committee um, and shown to the building committee as well. The one on the left goes on the Arlington High scoreboards um, and the one on the right goes on the Arlington High gym floor. So the one on the right will be very large, many feet across. Um, the one on the left will be on all the scoreboards on the fields as well as uh, in the gym. Now I'll switch to district. So before I do that, maybe I'll pause and ask if there are any questions for Dr. Jenger or myself about the APS logo development or AHS. No, that was really just an update. Okay. Actually, really quick, Morgan. Uh, is it also going to go on Pierce Field or whatever we're going to call Pierce Field? Um, Dr. Jenger, I believe the answer to that is no, because Pierce Field isn't getting redone anytime soon. So when Pierce Field is redone, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, five years out at this point. Our expectation is that the um, Monotomy Hunter symbol will be retired 
what will go on the middle of the field at that time, I think is still something yet to be determined. Assuming people like this logo and it's what we're using at that time, I would recommend it, but there may be more branding that's been done at that point. EPD. All right, so for Arlington Public Schools, uh, the options that you have in your materials and that I'll show in a moment were developed by our website vendor. They have a marketing arm. And so we asked them to do some um, graphic design for us as part of our project for the website. Um, this was, these were based on some answers to some basic questionnaires that we went ahead, we completed as a cabinet team. The questions were very basic, like what kind of style do you want? Do you want it to be simple? Do you want it to be um, traditional? What are you, you know, what's your district vision statement? We can base it on that. What's your district tagline? We didn't have a tagline, so they suggested some taglines to us. Um, we did we did give them our new vision, mission, and strategic priorities and asked them to incorporate that into whatever they designed. They attempted to incorporate some references to sustainability, to Spy Pond, to Minuteman Bikeway, um, and some references, like I said, to our strategic planning pieces in their tagline and in the imagery they provided us. We've done one round of revisions already, and we have one round remaining based on feedback that we get from all of you or from the community. So we can go back to them and say, we like these pieces, but not these pieces. We like that one, but incorporate this element of the other one into that one. Um, we have the opportunity to go back and get other options. We don't have to pick one of these options. Um, we have the, like I said, ability to integrate feedback and um, I would like to hear how folks would like us to proceed with getting any additional feedback from other members of the community. Um, we can send a survey out and get some input or we can take input from this committee and just go back to them with revisions and let everybody know what the final plan is and we would be fine with either version of that process. So branding option one, for all of these, the tagline is interchangeable. So I'm gonna show you the branding options and the taglines, but we could sw swap out the taglines for any of the visual branding options. Um, so this is option one. The original before we did the first round of revisions is down below. One of the things that we thought about and talked about was that this um, little guy looked a little lonely and so he needed a friend. Um, and so they gave us a friend and we also asked for a little bit of um, directionality to where they were walking. Um, so they added a path and a little bit sharper reference to the pond behind them. Um, so this is supposed to be water behind them. And then this is sort of a path that they're walking on. These are the two uh, taglines, creating leaders of tomorrow and education that empowers. This is option two. The original option down below is, was this one. Um, the, the, graduation hat came out not necessarily based on any feedback from us so that's something they could probably reincorporate uh, some of the feedback on this from cabinet team um, was around uh, the lowercase letters a few people had a sort of a reaction to the lowercase letters they didn't really love that um, a little bit of a reaction to sort of the puddle drop and you know could that water have a bit of direction to it and so with that feedback they gave us um, this version and this is the third version. Uh, the first one was down here. The feedback we gave them on this one was that it was a bit uh, clip art looking. And we were hoping that it wouldn't look like it was taken from clip art. And so we gave them a picture of Spy Pond and they actually used that to create this seal. And I'm withholding my own opinions because <laughs> I'd like to hear everybody else's on these. <laughs> Um, which is sometimes challenging to do. So the tagline option questions we have are education that empowers or creating leaders of tomorrow or some combination of those two. In the imagery, we're wanting to know what elements are compelling, what elements should be eliminated. Is there one that you just flat out don't like that we can easily eliminate for, for folks? Um, and then do we want to gather input from the committee, the committee and the community? Um, and how would you all prefer we go about making a final decision and thinking through what we want to integrate into the website and into our district communications. So um, as people have uh, comments or questions, so we're looking for both feedback on the logos and um, feedback on the process. I wasn't going to separate the two, um, so you can share your thoughts in both on both of those topics. Mr. Hainer. I'm just gonna 
initially react to the, the logos as presented. Uh, I like the branding the APS uh, on the set option two, uh, but I also like the, the two people walking. So I guess my feeling is bring the people down the number two and creating leaders of tomorrow. I think that belong in my mind with the logo piece, not under the title of Arlington Public Schools. I don't know how it would be incorporated, but. Oh, I, the over with the logo as yeah. opposed to under yes. the, okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I have no feeling whatsoever for number three. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> and any, any feedback on collecting feedback from others than us? My, me personally, the more people you get, the more people you're gonna uh, have negative feelings when you don't accept their, their piece. So, I mean, <laughs> It's tough, it's hard to do. Um, just letting people, the amount of people you would involve, let them know the final decision belongs to whomever. If they know that up front, I think that'll soften things later on. Mr. Carden? Sure. Um, so on the tagline, um, you know, creating leaders of tomorrow isn't in the vision statement. So I think it would be unusual to pull that out as our tagline. It wasn't an earlier draft. Maybe they read the wrong draft, I don't know. But one of the feedback from our here at the table was that that may not be the best mm -hmm. for our vision. So I wouldn't put it in the in the logo if it's not in our vision. Um, as far as which one, I don't have strong feelings. I I think maybe when you narrow it down to two or or something, you could shop it around a little broader than just the um, admin team. Just to if there's a sort of a visceral reaction of a larger group of people that oh, that's not yeah. good, then you would know. Ms. Morgan. Um, I like the two people under the tree, I think. Um, definitely with the cabinet team on the lowercase APS, it actually looks like an owl to me. Um, <laughs> does. I've gotten such varied reactions to that lowercase uh, one. It looks like an owl. I didn't get owl yet though. Uh, owl, um, so like not on, don't love that. Um, but I, I mean, whatever, uh, that I, this doesn't like scream spy pond to me. It actually looks like winger chic beach kind mm -hmm. of, <laughs> I mean, I totally believe that you gave them a picture of spy pond. But <laughs> I'm sure you didn't give them the wrong picture, but like, it doesn't, there's nothing to me. Um, I, I like the idea of that kind of iconography actually. Um, the circle, the seal. The cir like I, I, I like circles. I like, I, I like this, but like the problem is, is that like I don't know where that is in the picture, so I don't know. Um, yeah, so yeah, the other one is very clip arty, and I definitely don't see the pond in option one, but I, I believe it if that's what people say is there. <laughs> um, but that's cool. I, I mean, I don't, yeah. Anyway, uh, for feedback, I yeah, I mean, I I think I like the idea that people you know, are gonna see them. I like the idea that like students will see them and teachers will see them. And, you know, even if it's, it, even if we don't do like a whole like survey, like get them out to like faculty meetings and stuff and put them in front of people and then have somebody report back. And, and there's somebody out there who thinks that this one's an owl. So <laughs> I really think that you're gonna find somebody who sees an owl in that and, and that will be worth the whole exercise. <laughs> That's all, that's all I have. I think it's great that we're doing this though. I'm excited. Mr. Slickman. Owls well that ends well. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, when I first saw number one with the two taglines, um, the creating le leaders of tomorrow sort of resonated a little more, but then I thought about it and thought back to the message that was coming from our students during the, um, uh, during the strategic planning process, and they want to be empowered. Uh, they, they want us to help them go where they want to go. So uh, the more I think about it, the more I like education and empowers, which really does draw from the uh, uh, strategic plan. It, I, I, I agree that the one person was kind of lonely, and the second one is, I wish there was some way to get a waterfowl in there, you know, duck. a duck, one duck. 
you know, a duck, you know, the spy pond is filled with geese. Um, that would certainly send a message that it's a pond. Two leaves in the cold. I'd rather have the owl than the, than the little wavy APS thing. It just leaves me cold. And three is really very gray. It looks like a puddle. Um, and I, I can't imagine that being a logo. Uh, so bring, bring me to the two people, the tree, maybe a duck. You put a little duck over the schools on the other side. You know, I don't know, but that, that would get that would give it the feel of, of I, I like the waterfowl aspect. Uh, but uh, nobody else seems to. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not sounds like the pond might be a little lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like education that empowers. I I don't know. Well, I, the the tree with the two people under it is nice, and so is the uh, APS with this sort of. It looks like a path, like the kind of a path to the future. So that's kind of nice. So, but I I wouldn't use creating leaders of tomorrow. I I like education that empowers. Mm -hmm. And do you have any thoughts on collecting feedback? Well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I don't this know how necessary it is. <laughs> I think I think the superintendent get feedback from her staff and us, and that's probably enough. Okay. Dr. Um, I don't love any of them. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna be. Yeah. Uh, the okay. So the pond one, the last one, is just crazy. You can't have no idea what you're looking at. <laughs> Um, the circle idea is nice. I'm trying to decide if I would like this, the tree one with more, you know, if it was like in a circle, like the town seal is, uh, I don't, it means that it won't mesh, you know, go together with the Arlington public schools and stuff as well. But the specific tree that's drawn is just kind of weird. Um, <laughs> and the pond that, the illusion that there's a pond back there also is kind of weird because it it's going in a hill, which ponds can't do. So I'm a little confused. Um, anyway, it I don't feel any of them really give a really strong sense of place. Um, but if this is what we've got. Um, I'd say the tree one. Um, the other thing is if you look for feedback, I think you need to figure out what you're gonna do first if everyone says, like they have with the high school logo on multiple occasions, we don't like any of these. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, depending on how you solicit feedback, Either you need to be willing to go back to the drawing board or uh, know that you may be putting a logo out there that your feedback says we don't like it or, or whatever. So um, I don't, the second one doesn't, it, it just feels very generic. Um, Oh, and I like the empowering leaders of tomorrow. I mean, empowering whatever the education empowering, empowers. yeah, education empowers. That, that I like that. Um, I think that's Great. all. So I, I like one and two. I personally prefer the first one um, with the tree. I'm intrigued by your suggestion the um, about the circle. I, I think that that could could work. Um, I like education that empowers. Um, and, and I, I think some kind of feedback from teachers and students, um, you know, as we've talked about, um, sort of the creating the vision, vision and mission statements and getting feedback from students and talking about this sense of belonging is sort of something that, that you presented to the to the, to the school community on an opening day, um, I think giving the, the, the students and teachers a voice um, around some of that would, would help to bring that sense of belonging. Great. I, I 
have to ask yeah. Julie and Julie. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> so my first question is, did we pay somebody for this? Because we have this amazing department of all these art students who I think would love to do a competition to design the new logo. It was included in our was, process for okay. the website. Because it makes me sad that this isn't like student submitted, because mm -hmm. I think that we could get some really interesting stuff. Um, I love education that empowers. Mm -hmm. I think the other tagline implies that you don't have value if you're not a leader, and I don't like that. Um, there's a lot of people in the world who make really important contributions but wouldn't get be called leader. Um, the third one, take it from somebody who has a circle logo that I have to work with. You can't shrink it down. Mm -hmm. So like if you leave and just look at like that's, if you tried to take that circle and shrink it up into the corner of like a, a background, mm -hmm. you lose the words, you can't read them. Mm -hmm. So as in terms of something that's like flexible to adapt to different things, circles are hard. Um, the other two are fine. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so it's been a really fun first week of school. Um, we we're, we have a little bit of a circle logo happening at Audison right now. We have Bulldogs trying to bring back Bulldogs, and that's been really fun. Um, I'm not a big fan of any of these logos. Um, I, I'm so sorry. I hope nobody takes that personally. Um, I did like the the original one that people said looked like an owl, but as soon as <laughs> as soon as you said it looked like an owl, I was like, oh, that's why I like it because it looks like the Tootsie Roll owl. <laughs> I don't even like Tootsie Roll. Um, I it's gonna be a great year, <laughs> so, but I'm not sure. Like our. Are there any other options? Is this like, do we go back to the drawing board or is it these are the options and let's pick? <laughs> <laughs> this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm enjoying it a lot. I actually agree with most of what everyone has said. Um, we are, without paying more for the project that we've been working on, then no, we don't have a lot more back and forth. Um, did have the thought of soliciting graphic design from within the community. So that would be our drawing board plan <laughs> if we were to say we didn't like any of them. Um, that's, a, a, you know, something to undertake and has some logistical challenges to it. And I think we need to think about what we want to prioritize, whether it's the kids doing a competition for the new Bulldog logo, which I think they would get into, or for the district. So. Um, I, so I, I have thought about some of those things. Um, I'm hopeful we can come to some kind of conclusion with what we have, but if these are flat out rejected by the staff when we ask them for their opinions, then off to the drawing board we go. Chair Hainer. How soon does this have to be decided? We are, we launched the website without this because we wanted to give this the time that it deserved. So we are not on a tight timeline with this. We are, well, I will qualify that. If we want it on the wall of the new central office building, which I would like, um, we are on a little tighter of a timeline. We should decide this fall because they have to make the graphics for the uh, for the wall in phase two. Go white and all of that. We we could wait to put the graphic up on the wall if we had to. Wouldn't be the end of the world. So, oh, Stacy, good luck with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can offer. Bulldogs. I mean, uh, what about the cat lovers? You know, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. It's, it's, You've been here long enough to know the history of the two middle schools and the mascots and all the different colors yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know. We, yeah, I, I'd offer my cat up as a, as a volunteer for the logo. She's well loved. Okay. <laughs> but uh, no, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really think that if we're talking about a pond, we should have a duck. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I wrote the duck down. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on from this enjoyable discussion. <laughs> Fun. Um, so uh, now we are going to discuss um, the start of the 2023-2024 school year, specifically at AHS. Um, so this is for for people who are watching. Um, there are, and Dr. Homan will explain this a little bit in a lot more detail, but I just want to, so um, there are three weeks at the beginning of September, 2023, um, where the phase two will not be finished, where students should be, would be moving into their classrooms. Um, and the current plan is that 
uh, Fusco would be taken down in the summer. And so there are some, um, there's a discussion we need to have about what to do with the high school students during that time. Um, we had a subcommittee meeting a few weeks ago where many, but not all of the members were there. And then it was discussed at a building committee meeting where some members were there, but not everyone. So this is the first time that this full committee is hearing all this information at the same time. Um, so after Dr. Homan shares um, her report and Dr. Janger as well, um, we can ask questions and have a discussion. Um, and certainly people can share their position um, this evening, but we're gonna hold off um, until the next school committee meeting and to make a decision on which option we're going to choose to give everybody an opportunity to give feedback, hear the, hear the options, um, and to get, sounds like some more information would be most useful. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Yep. All right. <clears throat> So I'm gonna start with sort of an overview of exactly what the challenge is that we're facing and that we need to address. And then I'll talk through two options for um, the fall of 2023 start of school, walk through for each of the two options, what the impact is on both phase two and phase three move in and what the implications are for space schedule and finances um, at, at the time of both phases. Um, and then I'll show some timelines for option one and two in a calendar format that might be a little bit easier for folks to read. So based on the current project timeline in fall of 2023, Arlington High School is not going to have enough space to host the entire student body during the first three weeks of school before we are able, according to the current contracted timeline, to move into the completed phase two buildings on September 25th of 2023. Resolving this challenge has implications for the future of the project in phases three, two, three, and four. Um, it has some potential implications for student learning, depending on which options we choose and also on the overall project budget. So I'm going to talk through our options for addressing the challenge, both in phase two and phase three. Dr. Jenger is also here to answer any logistical questions you might have about the implications of, of option one or option two and the purpose of our discussion today is to consider those implications of both options, answer as many questions as we can. Um, this is a very complicated challenge that we've been thinking about for several weeks now. And the two options I'm showing you have come from lots of discussion with the owner's project manager, with our construction company, Consigli. Um, it is based in options they have given us and cost outs they have given us on what it might cost to do either one of these options. Um, and it's not, it, it is not feasible to move the pace of the project up. That is not a possibility. Um, it's not possible for us to put students at another site in town and run the high school schedule the way the high school schedule is designed and the way that would provide the most supportive start to our high school students. We don't have another building in town that can house 1500 kids and we can't split the kids into two groups across other buildings. And we will have school going on in all of our other school buildings, which means we can't accommodate kids in the other school building. So I just wanted that to be stated before we dive into the options. So here's a quick overview of our contracted construction timeline. The phase two transition um, includes uh, AHS phase two uh, being completed by the 19th of September of 2023. So that's the humanities wing and the central spine. So that would be available to us after the first few weeks of school, about 11 days in to move into, and then we would be able to start classes after the move. Fusco House and Blue Gym demolition begins before that in summer of 2023. So there are about three months there where the Fusco is offline and not available to us. And that's why there's not enough space to hold the entire high school student body from the time school starts to the 25th of September of 2023. Notably, the central office um, offices are also located in Fusco House. So that group of people would be need to be relocated uh, during the summer of that year, as well as for the first three weeks of school of 2023. Phase three transition as currently contracted uh, includes Arlington High School phase three, which includes athletics offices, lab uh, program, which is our um, special education collaborative program that's housed in Arlington High School, the administrative offices for the high school and Arlington community education being completed in September of 2024. The Downs House demolition is currently slated to begin three months before that in summer of 2024. So again, 
those um, programs, athletics lab, um, the uh, high school administration and ACE would be need to be relocated for those three months. There wouldn't be enough space to host all of those programs and offices between June and September of 2024. And we'd have to find an alternative solution for housing those programs. So we have two options. I'm gonna walk through option one first, which is to follow the contracted construction timeline with the challenges that I just described. So in terms of space, what this would mean is that demolition of Fusco would start in June of 2023, and we would have to use the current new building, the steam wing that has been constructed phase one and downs, and we'd have to build the connector in between the new wing and downs because there's um, Fusco is the connection between that area and down. So we would have to build a connector between those two buildings that would facilitate half day classes for the first 11 days of the school year. The implications of that um, are that we would need additional classroom spaces in order to accommodate the full schedule. So we would need to build those classroom spaces. We would need to build the connector, connector in terms of space. And we would only be able to accommodate half the student body at a time. So that means in terms of the schedule that we're creating a half day schedule for students for the first 11 days, the students would attend three classes a day and lunch morning and having lunch and then a shift coming in for lunch and then having classes in the afternoon because of how the schedule works and because some classes are mixed. So we would try to prioritize ninth and 10th grade classes. For example, this isn't it's hard and fast yet, but we would accommodate maybe ninth and 10th in the morning and 11th and 12th in the afternoon. Um, but some students have classes that mix grade levels. So there would be students who would have to stay and maybe have a gap in between their classes in order to attend their afternoon classes because it's a mixed class um, with upperclassmen, for example. Um, and we would also have students who would need to stay for the whole day, even if they didn't have afternoon classes due to transportation, for example, some of our Boston resident students. There would be approximately 30 fewer hours time on learning in 2023-24 um, and a disrupted student schedule for the first three weeks. We would probably, we, we would seek to eliminate some of that loss of learning time by absorbing some early release professional development time, which would mean loss of that professional development time. Um, and we would, in both of these options, need to accommodate the move, which we have some options for, but in this case, um, we probably need to cancel school and make up some days if we were to choose option one, uh, because I'm not sure if we could accommodate the half day schedule for the teachers um, and also accommodate some elements of the move. But we would have to work out the details of that if we were to choose option one. This will cost at least $125,000, but as we have worked on this proposal, we've identified a lot of additional costs that are associated with this proposal that aren't reflected in that 125. That 125 is what our owner's project manager has told us it's going to cost in order to build the connector. If we also build additional classrooms, that is cost on top of this. The cost of running our buildings, but only at half capacity is an additional cost to this. The cost of those 30 fewer hours time on learning that's the, you know, we spend money on our time that we spend with kids. And so there's a cost to that as well. And so this is definitely a minimum spend. Um, and there are costs in phase three, which I will walk through next. So if we do option one, um, this impacts not only phase two move in, but also the phase three move in. So we would need to do a demolition of downs um, in June of 2024, which means that Downs House wouldn't be available for, um, for lab program, which means we would need to use the space that's currently slated for Monotomy Pre-K to host the lab program, which would delay the move in of Monotomy Pre-K to their new space for about a year. They wouldn't be able to move in when phase two is finished because we would need that space in the summer of 2024 in order to house the lab program. Um, we would also not have a solution in this scenario for the lab program for the first three weeks of school in 2024, and we would need to relocate them, well, they, they may stay in the monotony space if we did this option, um, but they also may need to be relocated again if we were to use this option, depending upon how the monotony pre-K space was being used. So we have a delayed move in for monotony. We'd have two moves at least for lab. We would have a uh, swing space required for athletics and ACE, um, just in terms of space for option, for phase three, option one. There's no impact on the, student schedule um, for this one, with the exception of PE classes, which would probably need to be held outside. Uh, we would have um, some implications for like locker rooms that wouldn't be available. We wouldn't necessarily have access to all of our athletic spaces in this scenario. 
um, and the administrative spaces wouldn't be available until late September 2024, but those are offices and that's probably something we could work out. We would need to possibly rent modulars for athletics. Uh, we would need to find a new location for Arlington Community Education, which may include a <coughs> rental, um, and the cost of some of those things is to be determined as well as um, temporarily outfitting any of the monotony classrooms to be lab classrooms. So that was option one. At the building meeting, I took questions on each option after. Should I just go through? Um, I feel like I've covered these parts. Okay. Steve, why don't you go through all, all right, I'll keep going. So for, for option two, phase two transition, um, this would essentially shift the construction timeline on the project. So if we used option two, we would keep FUSCO online for the first three weeks of the school year in 2023-24 and not begin demolition until after the move um, into phase two. So we would have FUSCO open for the first three weeks of the school year, run a regular schedule and accommodate the full student body, and then move into phase two with either an adjusted schedule for our high school students um, using some half days to do the move like we did when we moved into phase one uh, or with a few full school days of move and then make up those days in later parts of the schedule. So we would have full school days to start the school year in this scenario. We would maintain time on learning, maintain early release times later on in the year for teacher professional development. Um, this would shift the project timeline back and the cost of that shift back in the project timeline because it requires us to keep all of our um, staff from our construction company and our owner's project management group online and also our architects because they have to continue to be paid and they're still on the project. It costs us, um, the building project, $1.2 million at least. In phase three, this would also keep Downs House online for the first three mm -hmm. months of the school year in 24-25 and demolition of Downs would begin in January of 2025. This would allow, if we can uh, adjust a timeline on a playground project, this would allow Monotomy Pre-K to move in sooner. It would allow Lab to maintain its space in Downs um, and only move once. It wouldn't have a significant schedule impact on the main student body. Um, we would still have uh, gymnasiums, locker rooms, lab program, and some administrative space available, but not until January of 2025. So that means that the opening of phase three gets shifted back three months as opposed to the opening of phase three happening in September of 2024, it would have to happen in January of 2025. And that's because the demolition delay on FUSCO then delays also the demolition of Downs. Um, and then the financial impacts of this is the same as the previous slide. The whole uh, shift of the project schedule uh, has that cost of $1.2 million to the project. So I have a couple of calendars here to sort of demonstrate visually the differences between option one. In option one, we start FUSCO demolition as, slate, as currently scheduled in June 2023. We have a three week half day schedule um, and a regular start of the school year in September of 2023 and September of 2024. Uh, we open phase two in uh, September of 2024 in both options, but we delay the opening of phase three um, until later in option two, but here phase three would open in September of 2024. And then in option two, all of that gets pushed back and you can see that the completion of the project gets pushed back about five months um, in option two. And that is because of the timing of work on the fields and some of the implications of the seasons of doing outside work on the fields. Um, there's about a three month delay to the demolition schedule in option two, and then there's another couple months uh, delay because of the field work that's happening outdoors. Um, over the course of winter, they can't do some of that work. So the completion of the project would be um, September, October of 2025 in option two. And you can see that this moved some of those timelines to the start of school or the start of demolition back. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Jenger is also on and he can answer any questions as well. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Um, if it's okay, I just wanna give sort of a process uh, update on from the building committee. So the building committee met on Tuesday night and Kirstie can uh, add to this and correct things. Um, and we uh, had some meetings with Sandy Pooler, our interim town manager, um, so the way this has to work is the building committee, the, the school committee takes a vote endorsing one of the options, one or two, and then the school committee and the vote 
makes a request to the building committee to withdraw the fund to to take appropriate steps to support either option one or option two and then the building so the building committee is scheduled to meet well we're trying to reschedule the uh, october meeting because of the uh, jewish holidays so that's kind of how the, the process would work the, the the funds would come out of contingency so we're not spending we're not going above the budget we're not spending money we don't have there's contingency funds in the budget there's 7.7 .7 million of contingency funds in the uh, high school building project left and um so uh uh, so, so there's different levels of comfort with using that money on the building committee. Some people um, are, are comfortable. Some feel that it's premature because we have a couple of big things ahead of us, which is the uh, abatement and demolition of Fusco House, the abatement and demolition of Downs House. And there could always be surprises in, the, in that process. And if we get to the end of the project and we are out of funds, we would cut certain things at the end of the project that people might want to have. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be clear, we're not going above the budget. It's a request by the school committee to the building committee to take funds out of contingency to support um, one of the options. So that's it. And uh, Ms. Exton, Dr. Allison Ampey, Ms. Morgan, we're all on the call and can and listen to the meeting. And of course you participated. Mr. Hainer. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but in the first part that she said, you're looking for 11 days, right? Yes. Any thought of starting the high, this program 11 days later? I'm talking heresy, but taking February and April vacation. That would be, that would be an option available to us if we were to not open school at the start of school at the high school. Um, I'm not sure that that would be a popular option. And I think that one of the challenges associated with that is that it would require a separate school calendar. I, I understand, but, I'm just, but the, the major part is looking for 11 days, am I correct? And they, the, if, you, if, you had a, if you did not have the deadline of June 30th as a school year and had the option to start a later time, would that solve the problem? Or is, as, is it more complex? I would say it's complex insofar as the, um, that, you know, running a school when we are currently, when we're slated not to be running a school has additional costs to it as well. So we have to have the custodians on staff and we have to have, a, so, and, and there's more efficiency realized when all of our schools are in session at the same time. Okay. So yeah, could it solve the time challenge? Sure, not without additional cost in addition to what- My second question out. is the 1.2 million in the second option that you talked about, does that include the additional time of four or five months with the contract and stuff of that nature? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I'd also like to note that some of the implications of other things that you were suggesting would have also have bargaining implications. We would need to bargain that with our units okay. who would need to be working during that time. Thank you. I, I didn't think it was that simple. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Slickin. Yeah, uh, killing the two vacations only buys you eight days because you legally cannot operate on the mm -hmm. two holidays on those weeks. Um, if we were to go with option one, are we guaranteed that we'd be able to move in on that date or uh, could something happen that would delay us a week or two, which would make it I'm totally untenable. It is a complicated construction project and that is a full year out and our society has been experiencing significant delays when it comes to the supply chain. So I would say, no, there's not a guarantee that if we were to go to op with option one, that we would have a backup plan if the project were to be further delayed. And in that scenario, while we do have the um, available hours in our high school schedule right now to meet regula regulatory requirements, um, such as the 990 hours that are required for instruction, we could be in a situation if the project were to be delayed where we would not be able to meet those regulatory requirements and would need to go to the commissioner for a waiver. Yeah, um, I, 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 I really hate to spend money to delay the project. And that was my initial reaction, we can camp out on the football field or do something just to get us over the first 11 days. But the thing that really is 
worrying me is, is what you just mentioned, is that there are supply chain issues right now going on. And if we don't get the steel on time, if we don't get the bricks on time, uh, if uh, forces out of, are out of our control that, that are going on everywhere, get in the way, it could be a week or two, and that's 10 days of instruction, and that really puts us in a hole. So the more I think about it, the more I'm think, uh, looking favorably at uh, option two, as much as I don't like delaying it. And I would hope that if we go to option two, uh, as soon as the building is ready, we're moving across and we can start the demolition as soon as possible. So, we, so we're not extending the delay by delaying the demolition. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask a question, which I know I've already asked you, which is, did you consider doing something like a tent city mm -hmm. where we create completely temporary school, I mean, a temporary classrooms um, on the parking lot or, or something? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you just review what you told me? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. And I'll also talk, ask Dr. Jenger if he wants to weigh in here because that was one of our earlier, earliest conversations related to this um, possibility. But yes, we have looked into that. Um, there are some pretty, there are big costs associated with that because of how many tents you would need. Um, there are costs also that I thought of after we had our conversation about um, associated with some of the realities of bringing that many kids outside and then back inside because if it's a rainy day for example you're going to have a lot of mess associated with some of that um, and then also if it, the weather is particularly bad needing to heat cool or otherwise manage some of those tents for extended period blocks of time during the day but dr jenger can you speak to some of the other things we thought about when we looked into the tent city on pierce field the tent city was one of my favorites so i'm glad someone thought <laughs> um so so the bottom line is to replace Fusco House, we need 25 classrooms. And in looking at all of the places that we could get classrooms, we could get 12 if we use the auditorium, the red gym, the areas of the field that we would be able to use. Um, because if we were to put tents on the field, we would damage the fields. And so it would be prohibited to put dance floors across the whole space, wire, electronic, and everything like that. So we were only able to get up to about 13 um, additional spaces, um, which isn't enough to allow us to keep running a full schedule. And then as Dr. Homan pointed out, that the logistics of that would have kids all the way out on Pierce Field coming around into Downs House and then running through the tunnel that was going to go up through Downs House um, to the other side. So there just wasn't enough to be able to do that. I, well, since I've got the microphone, I do want to just say one thing for parents who are concerned. Like, there, there's a plus and a minus. This is unfortunate, right? It means that instead of a nice, smooth start to the year, whether we're doing shifts or whether we're doing um, the FUSCO plan, there's going to be a little bit more moving and disruption than we would like for the beginning of the school year. But I also want to assure people that you know, we're going to sort of plan around the schedule to try to make a virtue out of necessity and really use that time to focus on giving kids a good supportive start to the year. So um, we're really interested to hear what folks think is the priority there, but we will make it work for the kids either way, just as we've been doing all year long. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I, so, I understand that the 1.2 million for option two is coming out of the contingency fund from the building committee. What um, I'm concerned about, it, you know, it says 125,000 there, but then for option one, but you know, that's just this connector. Mm -hmm. So the funds for additional space or dividers or what all the other things that would need to be involved in option one is that funding also coming from the building committee is that something that we would yes so one of the things that i think we need that i know we need to go back to the building committee with um, at our next meeting is a little bit more detail and come back to all of you with at the next meeting in two weeks is a little bit more detail about what some of those things that we weren't able to cost out before we had this conversation would actually be um, I think one of the things that um, has stood out to me is the fact that we are, 
you know, for every hour of instruction, we are paying a significant dollar amount. And the, there is a cost that is coming out of the school's general fund um, and all the other funds that we use to educate the kids of losing some of those hours of instructional time. And that would be an added cost to option two that's not gonna come from the building committee contingency, but is going to come. Um, it's essentially not going to go back to the students. And, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot uh, over the past couple of weeks. The, you know, as we estimate things like modulars, temporary space, it's also hard to get an exact number on that. We'll have to come up with some estimates because it's hard to know what rental cost of an additional space for say our administrative offices is going to be in a year or two. And we haven't worked out where exactly we would actually put our administrative offices in 2023 if we had that um, span of time where we didn't have access to Fusco in our offices. They are. And this, the option, I don't know if I mentioned the option one includes this like servery tent thing in the front, right? That's yes. That, so that's those are costs that are not on this. Those those the costs. One, are as I understand it, the one twenty five is the, for the connector. No, that Liz, it's it's not. Sorry. It's not. It, it's for the one twenty five is for five classrooms, the connector and the server. And the server, yes, okay. the whole thing. But five classrooms where, Doctor Jenger. In the uh, auditorium. In the auditorium. No, I recognize that there are a lot, a lot of costs that are not there. I just wanted to be clear on what they were and where they were coming from. Um, so something else that I've been thinking about, and we've talked about this, but um, with monotony is um, if monotony gets in option two moves sooner than um, than was on the schedule or when the schedule is, um, will they have a playground or outside space or? We wouldn't move them without a outside space, okay. play space for them. Okay. Um, but we, and we have looked into whether or not there would be a cost associated with moving the playground part of that project up. Right now it's actually slated for very late in the project as part of phase four. Um, some of that seemed to be because there was a feeling that we might need to use the monotony space for the lab program for a temporary period of time while Downs was being demolished. And because there was concern about having our preschoolers on site during construction. I think we've learned through living through construction on site that it's actually really not as disruptive to those who are in the new wings as we might have previously imagined that it would be. And I don't have any qualms about having our pre kers with all the safety precautions that we have in place on our construction zones right now um, in their new space once it's available. And there is a cost to the town of, um, you know, not having access to farm enter, which they could easily rent out. Um, if monotony were not in that space. No, I, I, I want them, the, kid, the pre K to be in their new space. I just want to make sure they have outside. Yes, they will. Yeah. Um, okay, I think those were my questions that didn't get answered. Um, Ms. Heath? Hi, um, I'm just trying to get caught up because I haven't seen this before. Uh, so would the two, the half day schedule for those 11 days or maybe a few more, in, like lengthen the length of the work day? For any staff, not right now. No. Okay. Um, I I'm just gonna put in a plug for our high school teachers right now. Some of them are working in really deplorable conditions. Um, their windows. I don't know if you've seen the back side of the building. Anything facing construction has been completely taped off. There's no fresh air that comes in. Some of them got air conditioners. Some of them didn't. They can't see out the windows at all. So the kids are in like windowless boxes. I think anything that's gonna delay them and keep those in those rooms longer is gonna be more detrimental than half days for a couple of weeks. Um, because the truth is by Thanksgiving, nobody remembers the first half of September anyways. Um, you know, you're in your rhythm and you're going. So I, I think the idea of delaying and keeping people in the old rooms and the old buildings for longer is going to be more detrimental in the long run. I wanna qualify two yeah, things. Sure. One, um, the rooms in Downs get fresh air through the Univents and do, do have appropriate air exchange rates, and we test that. Yeah, no, uh, but they, you're right they, that the windows are closed off and they yes, can't open the windows. Yes. yes. I just, for community Sorry. members watching, wanted to ensure that we I'm are. I'm not worried about like we are ventilating. safety. I'm yes. worried about, you know, when there is an odor and you can't just open the window and like blow the yes, fan out. That is true. Yeah. Um, and that both option one and option two have us moving on September 25th of 2023 into the new wings and into the new classrooms. The difference is that we would be either running a full schedule in Fusco 
for those first three weeks, or we would be running a half schedule for those first three weeks. Um, it'd be a half schedule for the kids, not for the staff, and there are no implications on staff workday based on what we've currently sketched out. And the next year as well? The following year doesn't have implications for classroom teachers in that phase three doesn't include classroom spaces. We would all be in the new wing in, in um, September of 2023 for most of the classroom spaces. It's just some of those other programmatic spaces that wouldn't have access to their newer rooms. So people wouldn't be in downs just because we're keeping downs online. Mr. Yeah, just, so just one thing to, to make sure we're clear on the, the, the impact is on the end of the project. So the, the field work wouldn't be done until August of 2025 rather than April of 2025. So that's, that's and extending all those people ha working more time and all that stuff is, is, is a big part of the cost. So, I mean, I think the, <clears throat> we, I tried to get a, a straw poll of the building committee, but that, People didn't want to do that, so um, <clears throat> so I, I'm not sure where they are going to land. But I do think what, what I said. I don't know if everyone agreed with this. Is that I really think the building committee should do whatever the school committee decides. I think that's the right thing to do. So the school committee makes a decision that's in the that it feels that we feel collectively is in the best interest of kids. Then hopefully the building committee will agree. But I can't guarantee that. So um, I think that's that's why we have to build a case for whatever option we choose. And that's why uh, Dr. Holman was asked to do some more research on option one to get the full two costs to your point, uh, Ms. Exton. That's, 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 what we're, that's the homework we have to do over the next week or so. I will tell you, <clears throat> just to put it out there, that um, I am strongly leaning towards option two um, because I think that's, in the best interest of our students, it is a risk. It may mean uh, that we're not able to do something at the end of the project because we're using 1.2 million of contingency right now. But um, to me, uh, that's a risk that we would have to take and we would have to confront together as a community. And uh, I mean, I still wanna hear from more people in the community, but I, I think given some of the disruption our teachers and our students have encountered over the past few years, we all have uh, uh, encountered this. It's um, for everyone to start fresh in 23 full days of school, normal school, all ninth graders, all teachers, feels like the right way to begin the school. It's also the right way to begin uh, life in a new building. So, but we're gonna get more information. We're gonna discuss it more next week. Ms. Morgan. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I, I appreciate the way that we're doing this. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the sort of reaction that we're going to see from folks um, sort of in the interim two week period between now and the next time that we meet, um, which is fine. I just, um, I think, you know, we're going to get some more information. I've been really pretty unequivocal about this from the beginning. I really think kids need to be um, in school and have their time with um, their peers and with their teachers and that we'll never know uh, what the cost might be of having a disrupted start to the school year. Um, but it's, you know, it's potentially significant. Um, and I, I was talking with uh, one of my kids, former teachers today on my way into a meeting here and, and we were talking about school starting and and I, I said something to the effect of, you know, the, the whole, like, we're, we're experiencing this period right now, right, that, that we would be disrupting next year. And students meeting their teachers, seeing them almost every day, that it really only works if kids build those relationships with the adults who are, who are going to teach and lead and, and who they're going to learn from. And so I... You know, I I hope that we support option two. Um, I hope that the building committee, in turn, is able and in a position to support option two. Um, and so, you know, I um, I just I I'm a little worried that people are going to feel that we're yet again sort of dithering around: Are kids going to school? Are they not going to school? Um, and so I guess for me, all I can control is that I, I think kids need to be in full days of school. Yes, I think it's expensive. Um, I think it's worth it. 
Um, so, you know, I plan to support option two when um, I guess we're planning on voting on this in two weeks. So that's where I'm at. Mr. Friend? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, if, if, if it would be helpful to come to a, a joint decision, then we could have a joint meeting with the building committee. But if, if, they, if you think they're gonna <laughs> defer to us, then we don't need to do that. But I, I do think, you know, and there's two of you on the both committees, so you can definitely communicate what we're saying, but superintendent and the too. superintendent as well, yeah. Um, but but if I mean we're not, I'm not hearing their concerns. If the only concern is not being able to put the lights on the field, for example, we can find money for the light, lights on the field somewhere else. I mean, I want to know what their concerns are that they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, the, do you want me to answer? Sure. That? Yeah. So the I mean, the concerns are is that we have seven point seven million dollars in contingency left, and that um, when you do an abatement and demolition of a building all sorts of things would come up that we didn't anticipate. Yeah. So their concern is that we would use all the contingency too soon or get to a point where we'd have to take votes to not do things at the end of the project. Right, right. And so when we signed the project funding agreement with, with the MSBA, we're actually not allowed just to go to other places to get money. Um, right, right, but the original plan was to not include the lights, knowing that at some point- well, Correct. We, we would add the lights in some, well, somehow, well, 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 right? Yeah, but let me let me finish. Yeah. So we we, we could correct at the end of the project, we yeah. can value engineer, we can take out certain things. Mm -hmm. We could say, we're not gonna do the lights on the, on the facility, on yeah. the fields. Yeah. There are some people who really want lights. Yeah. Um, uh, we could say, we're not gonna do the connection from the bike path yeah. to the school. There are certain things, we, we have options at the end of the project to say we won't do certain things. And so absolutely, and we could take those votes on the committee and not do certain things. That's how it works. But there, I, I don't know if a joint meeting is, the, is what we, I mean, what we agreed to was, committee would take its vote and we would, I mean, I can't speak for, for Kirstie or Liz, but we would go to the building committee and say, look, the, 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 the school committee strongly feels whatever we feel by vote. And I'm gonna urge you, everybody on this committee to vote the way the committee has voted. And <clears throat> they may ignore that or vote. I don't know what they're gonna do. I really don't, I can't predict that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me again, I, I think to spend the 1.2 million to avoid this disruption to me is worth it. And I understand the concern about the contingency and, and what I'm trying to say is we're, that 1.2 million has to come from somewhere, mm -hmm. it can come from somewhere else if, if we end up with some other concern within the building project, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, not technically, but by moving things out of the project, we can fund them separately later. Uh, yes, we, 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 could, we could say, the building committee could say, look, we're gonna value engineer out. We're not gonna do certain things. Right. And we're gonna ask. We can lower furniture and fixtures, for example, and fund that somewhere else. I don't think we can, because that's in the, pro no, no. So we, we would take, no, we can't do that. No. So let, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's, 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 there's things that we could, yeah. okay. we could, we could look at, yeah. but you're kind of constrained by a uh, guaranteed maximum price and a project funding agreement signed with the MSBA. Yeah. And then at the, as you get to the end of the project, there are certain things you say, we're not gonna be able to do them. Right. And they're deferred to whenever the town can get to it right. by however the town can do it, or they're not gonna be done at all. Yeah. That's a possibility. We all understand that. But right. there are some people, committee represents different constituencies in the community. And there are some people that are like all those things at the end of the project. So that, that's it. So. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Alexandri. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to speak to a couple things. First, we haven't talked that much about what the problems are if we were to have a further delay in the project. And I think that's one of the main things that really pushes me towards option two. But I personally was not in favor of taking a vote tonight or even a straw poll because we're basically weighing two not great options. Mm -hmm. Either we're putting our kids through a less than optimal start of the school year and keeping the project on track and keeping funding, keeping our contingency well enough that we hope to get to the end of the project and be able to fund everything we expect to fund. Or we're going to be spending a big chunk of money, possibly endangering some of the stuff at the end of the project and 
delaying the project itself. So everyone won't have, be able to benefit from um, chunks of the new building until, you know, three, five months later, or three months later. Um, it's, I think it's a big enough decision that we shouldn't just hear about it and vote on it the same night. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am in favor of, as has been scheduled to wait um, a couple of weeks. And I don't think we're dithering. I think we're giving it good consideration and building our case so that we have the information that we want. Um, so I was gonna say something else, now I've forgotten. Um, oh, in terms of the contingency and stuff, I do think we're in a good position that the bulk of the building is all going to be done by the end of, well before the end of the project. So the thing, you know, it'd be different if we had a wing of the building that was the last thing that we were building. Mm -hmm. And I would feel different about mm -hmm. the contingency in that case. But in this case, we're talking about fields, lights, bike path, which are things which are more easily severable from the project without actually necessarily meaning that they would never be done. Whereas if it was an actual building, we'd be like changing the materials and you know, there's all sorts of stuff that would have to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is, you know, we're in a good situation in terms of the timing of the project and, and what we're building when, um, but it is a big decision, so. You can breathe a sigh of relief and contingency when <coughs> when the demolition and abatement is done. So when, when the demolition and abatement of Column House is done, that was like good news. All right, good, we're in good shape. Then when, the sooner Fusco House gets down to the Blue GM and there's no surprises there, that's good news. Downs goes down, no issues there, that's good news. So those are like the, the three milestones for contingency. So I, I, was, I was waiting for like a call over the summer with something at Column Hall, but it never came. I checked in frequently and everything was good. Okay. All right, so we'll come back in two weeks to um, vote on one of these two projects. And, and we'll get a further report on the cost of option one and where that funding would come from. Yes. Because it's, it, it's not $1.25 million with, uh, versus zero. So it's going to be 1.25 versus 125. Yeah, the million. funding will come from more than 125. It'll be more than 125. It will be in very much an estimate, whereas mm -hmm. the 1.2 isn't as much of an estimate. Mm -hmm. And it will all both in both scenarios, it's coming from contingency. Yeah. So, so we're not making a 1.2 million decision. We're making, say, a one million or an eight hundred thousand dollar decision. We'll work on getting more details on that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get. I mean, no. So just. So if we're when Dr. Holman does a research and comes back with a report on option one, it'll be one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars out of contingency, maybe a little bit more, plus operational impact, operational cost, right? That's what you're doing an analysis of. Um. Yes, we've done an analysis where we've taken a look at what the instructional time right. cost is, and and that's those are dollars that essentially we would spend anyway, but would not go back to right. the students. And I can share that as well. It's yeah. a little bit. Of, it, it's a little bit of more of a mental exercise than it is um, anything else. But I think yeah. it's worth considering because it's part of the cost of that option. Right. It's town money. It's right. It's it's it would right. right. It's town <coughs> money. Mr. Hainer. Maybe I that 125000 plus is dealing with construction costs and other costs, maybe educational costs outside of the construction? There are certainly educational costs to consider outside of the construction. What I'm saying is the additional, when you said there was possibly more than 125000 is that related to construction, which is part of the contingency, or is there other costs that we have flexibility on? Outside of the SBA. There are not really costs that impact our operating budget. Okay. No, there are there are the opportunity costs essentially associated with losing 30 hours. So money we're talking about in option one and option two. It's all contingency. It's all contingency money. Thank you. Right, but Dr. Holman's been asked to explain this to the building committee, the opportunity. But that's right. But I mean, but there are also costs around 
outfitting lab temporarily that aren't in the 125. Correct. Rental modulars for athletics and community ed that aren't in the 125. So it's, I mean, it's 125 and 1.2 and this one's going to come closer. The question is how. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's that's the number that we need to yeah. see that it's, and I, that I think we need to share with the building committee. Right, right. Is that it is closer to one point two million dollars than one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and that's that's the piece that we want. Yeah. Right. I think that would okay, be a lot that, easier to make Okay. All right, I think you're right, though. We're going to move on. <laughs> uh, It'll all work out. We'll superintendent's see. report. So I will start not with a graph <laughs> displaying the number of COVID cases in the district. Um, but with a strategic planning update. So I wanted to provide a little bit of an update um, on what where we're at with strategic planning. We did provide a more comprehensive update to the um, curriculum instruction and accountability um, subcommittee on in late August. We have a smaller group of individuals, um, most of whom came from the original larger group that did the mission and vision work. And this group is um, made up of administrators, teachers, community members, uh, in four subcommittees, one subcommittee per strategic priority. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Janger soon, now that the kids are back in school, about whether we can add a student member to perhaps priority one um, to work on that one with us as well. And this group split into their subcommittees has the task of developing two to four strategic initiatives for each of our uh, four priority areas. So over the course of the next several months, they're going to be working on this. Um, the goal is for them to have drafts of strategic priorities ready at some point in October that we can start uh, workshopping with members of the community and getting feedback on and then redrafting. Um, and then in order to bring a draft of a strategic plan to the school committee and CIA subcommittee for consideration later on in the school year around December. Um, our hope, our current timeline is to have a strategic plan ready for approval by the school committee at some point in January of 2020, what year are we in, three? Um, and they, uh, we, we are definitely, like I said earlier tonight, planning on having some forums throughout the fall to look at the vision and mission with members of the community that I'll be coordinating with um, Ms. Thomas um, and other members of our team. One of the things that we've said to the strategic planning committee is that the, these initiatives, if they are strong, will have a direct tie to the vision and mission. They will directly address the priority area with concrete actions and long-term changes that we can break into specific steps over multiple years. They will connect directly to our students' experience. Um, they'll be useful for guiding our operational decisions within the district, including our budgeting decisions, and have clear metrics for success. It will look, you know, we will see um, this kind of improvement if we are successful in this area. It will define important outcomes while leaving some room for adaptation. We need to have some flexibility to adjust as we go. And uh, we'll also include a picture of the resources, um, particularly the financial budgetary resources needed and a plan for implementation. Um, these groups have just gotten started. They've, some of, some of the groups have had um, on sort of on their own subcommittee meeting over the last few weeks. And other groups have sort of done some offline works trying to understand the work that's already going on in that in that area. Uh, one important question that came up in one of our early meetings was, wait, are we creating 12 brand new initiatives for the school district? And the answer to that is absolutely not. We want to continue doing some of the work we're already doing because we don't just wanna be piling on and adding to things. Um, we wanna really make sure we're strategic. So some things are already happening that, we're, that we've shared with them and said, you know, we expect to see this, for example, the redesign of professional development. We expect to see that in priority two. Um, some of the work we've done around curriculum and are planning to do around elementary ELA curriculum, we expect to see in priority one. And so uh, the community, have, the group has already gotten debriefed on that and we'll be incorporating that into the uh, initiatives that they bring forward. We had a very successful first day of school. It has been absolutely wonderful to see everybody back in classes, lots of smiling faces. Um, this week and I'm showing a few pictures from the first day of school that folks took as they were out and about a couple from Pierce and Thompson Elementary and our fantastic uh, METCO and diversity equity and inclusion team were over 
uh, where I guess they were down at the high school in front of the Metco office. Uh, we didn't have any real challenges on the first day of school that we heard about. Um, we had rain and we had elections and it all went very smoothly. Um, and we had a lot of uh, little logistical things to figure out along the way, but we had a really great first week so far and we only have one day of it left and I'm sure it will be a fantastic Friday. Um, a few quick additional updates. We did receive a grant, uh, Dr. McNeil referenced this earlier, to support uh, social emotional learning, behavioral mental health and wellness. Um, an SEL grant essentially in the amount of $212,500. And that is supporting some additional staffing, some more um, professional learning around youth mental health first aid. I'm sure they'll run more courses on that and responsive classroom and resources to support SEL instruction in the classroom, as well as some additional SEL support for our staff. We have launched our elementary before care program pilots. There are five students currently enrolled at Thompson and 15 students at Pierce, but we also have a drop-in option and are hopeful that families will take advantage of that when they need it. Um, we are able to provide scholarships to eligible families. So if you know families who are um, financially constrained by the program and but still need access to it, we hope that they'll reach out to us and see if we can accommodate them. Um, and I also wanted to provide a quick transportation update. We are looking into the feasibility of a bus that would act essentially as a shuttle from the east side of Arlington towards Audison. Um, it would be fee-based and families would need to sign up for it so that we could establish some sort of stop um, plan because it can't stop in one place. That would be too many kids in one place. So it would need to go to some strategic areas around town in order to bus students over to the Audison. This is in response to challenges we know our students have had with the MBTA. We are not yet prepared to launch it, but we are seeing what it would involve, making sure that we would have the appropriate staffing um, and resources in place in order to do that and mapping out um, what stops would look like. So we may send a, an inquiry survey out to the community to see what the interest level would be um, and what some of the transportation challenges are for our families, whether they're still encountering those um, or whether this has been resolved by additional routes added by the MBTA. I haven't heard anything yet from families on this challenge, but we certainly do throughout the year and have. Uh, we also, uh, I also wanted to update everybody that the Gibbs bus has also been a, a, a bit of a challenge this year. We filled up the spots for the Gibbs bus almost immediately um, based on our requirement to bus any students who are two miles or more away from Gibbs and didn't have any room for fee-based spots or wait lists um, on the Gibbs buses this year. So it's clear that that's being used um, and that became a capacity challenge. And so one of the things we're thinking about when we think about Audison is do we wanna increase capacity for our sixth grade students who are using those buses? Is there a way to do that? Um, and if not, then maybe we can use those resources to help out with the kids who are coming from East Arlington across town to the Audison. So I just wanted to provide a bit of an update on that because I knew that that had been some conversation and that some parents had had some challenges associated with transportation to start the year. Um, a couple additional updates um, in athletics. We had over 540 students try out for fall sports, which is somewhere between 80 and 100, Mr. Bowler told me, uh, more than we've had in previous seasons. We have some very competitive, talented, and excited teams um, starting games this week, and they've all been out practicing and very enthusiastic about the start of the fall season. They seem very happy to be um, back at athletics this fall. We have one active search currently for an administrator role. As you all know, our spectacular Mr. Mason has been offered the role of deputy town manager and will be um, headed over to across the street um, offices before too long. He is staying with us as we get ready to launch the budget process and we currently have the position posted. That posting closes on September 16th. We're planning on doing initial interviews the following week of September 19th and final interviews the week of September 27th. And I will be putting together an interview committee um, very, very soon. Uh, and we'll keep you updated on the progress of that search. I updated your enrollments. We're currently projecting about 150 more students compared to last year's October 1 numbers. We have overall increasing enrollment at the secondary level. Um, a slight increase at elementary uh, overall, though it looks as though our elementary enrollments are leveling off and are fairly consistent with the projections that we've received. We do have a new half learning community at grade eight at Audison that rolled up. Um, we had accelerated that additional half learning community last year at grade seven and we're rolling that up now into grade eight. And those are my updates for today. I'm happy to take any questions.
Ms. Morgan. Um, I think the athletics update is great. One of the things that I, as we, as we talk about how our increasing enrollments at the secondary level, um, I worry about how many kids are cut from sports at the high school. Um, so I guess I, I think John probably has um, data on that. I hope so. If he's not, I, I hope that he can be directed to track that because um, as these cohorts, the big one, the, the high water mark is the current fourth grade, but these groups are just going to get bigger and bigger as we start marching those kids through. And I, I'm, I'm happy that, that we had more kids try out and I'm happy that they're not paying fees to, to participate. And if that helps more kids participate, that's great. But if they can't make the team, um, then that's, that's not great. So I would like to know how many kids are being cut from fall sports, winter sports, spring sports, um, so that we can start to look at that because um, I, I, that's something I worry about a lot over the next um, five, six, seven years. Just to tag on to what Ms. Morgan said, I think the question isn't just how many people are cut, but also is there a way we can expand our offerings so that they have some place to play mm -hmm. um, either you know, there's all sorts of different things it could be mm -hmm. um, but that's I, mean, I think mm -hmm. that's really Absolutely. what we're looking yeah. for is trying to make sure that you know what would be entailed to make sure that we have yeah. offerings for our students who want to play a sport mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what do we need to do to see that happen anybody else Thank you. So now we have a possible vote to approve the AEA Unit C contract, which is the administrative assistant throughout the district. Um, does anyone want to? Rob, do you want to? Rob, sorry. Do you wanna, Mr. Spiegel, share anything about that before we? Um, we had the successful negotiations with AEA Unit C, and we uh, reached a memorandum of, of agreement, um, which um, my understanding is that the unit C has ratified and um, we previously discussed this in an executive session um, a few weeks ago. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's a good, fair uh, <clears throat> contract. And I want, want to credit again, Mr. Mason for um, you know, he's uh, one of the things he's been very helpful at for all of the negotiations this year is really thinking creatively about how we can um, have a salary structures that will um, both re re um, attract and retain staff. And I think he's really driven us forward, I think, in several of our units to be able to do that. All right. Um, would someone like to make a motion to approve the AEA Unit C contract from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2025? Mr. Thielman? So moved. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion? And to authorize the chair to sign on our behalf. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any discussion? I have the signature. Oh, you have it for me to sign. <laughs> okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. All right, I will sign that after the meeting. We'll the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so now we have um, a possible vote to approve a contract with our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction, Dr. McNeil. Um, I know Dr. Holman would like to say a few things. Is there any questions? All right. So you have in your materials a proposed contract renewal and salary adjustment for Dr. McNeil right here. Um, who is currently in his sixth year as Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. I'm pleased to bring you this contract renewal for your consideration and would like to say a few words about why I've brought it forward. Um, during his time in the district, Dr. McNeil has been a tireless advocate for improvements to our educational system in Arlington that promote equity, equity and inclusion. Under his leadership, Arlington has interrogated early literacy practices and curriculum and implemented curriculum and pedagogy consistent with the science of reading. We've expanded instructional coaching at the elementary level to support instructional improvement. 
We've supported and implemented practices such as ACE blocks to give teachers needed planning time to make adjustments to instructional practice based on formative assessment data under his leadership. And we have conducted audits of our curriculum and teaching which have supported the expansion of representation of diverse identities in our curricular materials and expansion of professional learning opportunities, which you've talked about earlier tonight, that support culturally responsive teaching practices. Um, during his tenure, he select, successfully supported curriculum and instructional improvements through two challenging years of pandemic education, um, alongside all of the challenges that came along with that. And we're looking forward to sharing some good news about student growth as soon as our MCAS scores are released to the public and are no longer embargoed. Dr. McNeil is overseeing really exciting improvements to professional learning this school year, um, as well as to continuing to build out our coaching models and our literacy work that will support strategic priority one, ensuring equity and excellence, as well as strategic priority two, valuing all staff. These achievements for our system are significant and foundational to the work we're looking forward to over the next few years. And very importantly, only leaders who are thoughtful, reflective, and humble are able to facilitate the kinds of instructional improvements that he has accomplished for the Arlington Public Schools during his time here. In my 14 months of superintendent, I have observed that Dr. McNeil models all of those qualities in his work with the leadership team. He's consistently willing to interrogate and improve upon his own leadership practice in order to better serve our schools, our leaders, and most importantly, our students. And for these reasons, I hope you will support the renewal of his contract this evening. But now, I'm just gonna make more. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for a motion to approve the contract with Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, Dr. McNeil, and to authorize the chair to sign it. So moved. Motion by Mr. Hainer. Second. Second by Mr. Schlickman. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? An abstention? It's unanimous. Thank you, Dr. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much for your confidence and faith in my leadership, and I look forward to uh, our what we can accomplish together as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job now to come up with the perfect logo. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have some policies to discuss and approve, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, uh, on. Uh, August 12th, the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee met to consider things that were remaining on our plate after June. First one was the Secure Gun Storage Resolution that was brought to us by some Arlington parents. Uh, the, you know, first of all, we, as a practice, will not go and adopt something that's brought to us in, in a public comment period. Uh, also, the form of the resolution, a resolution is designed to express an opinion. It, it is not directive. And the original form of the resolution presented to us had the committee directing the superintendent to do things, which is not appropriate in the resolution. Um, so we had Chief Flaherty into the meeting, and she discussed what is being done right now. Uh, there are a couple of notes about some of the things she said in the minutes of the subcommittee meeting. Uh, there is currently tremendous cooperation between uh, uh, the police department and public schools in, in terms of gun safety, and that we are on track to do the things that are in, in the context of the resolution. So that the bottom line was to change the directive to a statement of support for this work. And so that uh, because it was essentially before us before and we knew it was coming and it's not a policy, it's a resolution. I will move approval of the resolution as put forth in the uh, report. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? Abstention? It's unanimous. Uh, thank you. Next up is uh, first read for file AD, vision, mission, and strategic priorities. Basically, this is housekeeping. We are taking the new vision, mission, and strategic pri priorities that we adopted in June uh, and codifying them in the policy manual. So when this is adopted, be it through uh, uh, suspension of the rules tonight to go to second reading or to or, or by waiting two weeks to adopt it, we will replace the old 
uh, vision statements with the one that's current. So right now, we're, we're not current. This just puts in the language that, that we essentially adopted in June. So I'll make a motion to first of, uh, to suspend the rules to bring this to second reading. And that would require a two thirds vote after which we would vote to approve the, the policy. Second. All right, a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer to suspend the rules um, for a second reading. That was in favor. Ooh, discussion. Just one just question. Thing. So the urgency of doing this now? It, it's just it, it's just administrative. Yeah, we, okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. the thing is, the policy that's in our manual right now doesn't match what okay. we voted in June. That, uh, that's why we, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Any other discussion? Um, Ms. Morgan, sorry. Just can when when we approve this, can we just make sure that the capitalization is consistent with the rest of our policy? Superintendent, school, and committee, I think, are generally capitalized. I was just I'm literally doing this as is, but those seem to be able to be made um, administratively after we vote this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're voting on the motion to suspend the rules mm -hmm. of this. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That's unanimous. Um, now a motion to okay move to adopt uh, uh, file AD. Motion by Mr. Schlickman, sec seconded by Mr. Hainer to uh, adopt file AD. Discussion. Those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. That's unanimous. Uh, finally, we have before us file FF-E, Procedures for Naming AHS Special Spaces. This is a second read. We did the first read in June, and there were concerns from the committee, so we did a rewrite of this to meet the concerns that were expressed. So uh, the things that we were looking at before was in terms of being very specific about the spaces that are being named and the tenure of the committee. Uh, we, we've addressed the questions that were put forth. So I will move adoption of FF-E. Motion by Mr. Slickman, second by Mr. Hainer uh, to adopt file FF-E. Any discussion? Okay, those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Slickman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, we, uh, the next agenda item, we have a regular school committee meeting scheduled for June 8th, 2023, which happens to also be the lab graduation. Um, and so Dr. Homan had asked if we could possibly move that so that um, any of us could attend uh, that graduation. So we looked at the calendar um, to the Thursdays before and after that date and um, felt that June 15th um, at our regular time of 6.30 made the most sense. Um, so if, unless people are <laughs> opposed to that, um, I'll entertain a motion to change the date of our June 8th, 2023 school committee regular meeting to June 15th, 2023. I move. Motion by Dr. Allison Anthony. Second. Seconded by uh, Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? That's unanimous. Mr. Hainer. I'm abstained. You're, oh, okay. Sorry. Mr. Hainer abstained. So six in favor. He won't be so there. June 8th is now June 15th. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, Ms. Diggins, can, well, you'll change that on the um, APS calendar. Also. Thank you. All right. We have a Big consent agenda. <laughs> oh, and I don't think that. It's been a couple of months. It has. Okay. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22302 in the amount of $423,736.28 on July 12, 2022. Warrant number 23011 in the amount of $290,277.22 on July 26, 2022. Warrant number 23021 in the amount of 
$26.61 on August 9th, 2022. Warrant number 23032 in the amount of $659,182.17 on August 23rd, 2022. Warrant number 23044 in the amount of $1,444,376.72 on September 6, 2022. Approval of meeting minutes from school committee meetings, June 23rd, 2022. Approval of meeting minutes from school committee retreat, July 26, 2022. Approval of meeting minutes from school committee retreat, August 9th, 2022. And approval of meeting minutes from school committee special meeting, August 9th, 2022. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That's unanimous. Okay, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi. So budget met earlier this afternoon um, and we basically are trying to get our work going and discuss the <laughs> FY22 budget, the FY23 budget, how we're going to plan for the FY24 budget, um, any updates in program fees and uh, ESSER and then what we're anticipating coming for long range planning and the CFO search. Uh, the last thing um, Dr. Homan asked if any of us would be willing to serve on the committee and we've actually got all three of us are willing to so we're going to see who can make the meetings and um, so we anticipate having someone on the CFO search committee and that's basically it. We'll be meeting again fairly soon, I think. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. The community relations subcommittee reports and recommends appointments and reappointments to town commissions and town committees to the full committee. The community relations subcommittee recommends the reappointment of Stuart Akeda to the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, Stuart Deck to the Poet Laureate Committee, Christine Carney and Sharon Grossman to the Human Rights Commission. Therefore, I move that the full committee approve these four reappointments. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer and a second by Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Mr. Schlickman? I'm happy to vote for this. These are really high quality people and I'm proud to say that they're representing us. In the reappointments as well. Yes. Anybody else? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? Abstentions? That's unanimous. And uh, hopefully on uh, September 22nd, uh, uh, Kim Goldsmith will be coming seeking appointment from us. <coughs> She's going to be available for us to talk to, to uh, the LBGTQIA plus Rainbow Commission. That's just for information for the committee. We'll, we'll be provided with a CV. Pardon me? We'll have a resume or CV. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she'll come, right? And she'll come well, too. We're in the process of it. She's being invited. We haven't had that confirmed. Yeah, right, right. Okay. It'll either be the next meeting or the following one for sure. Yeah. Thank you. CIAA, mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan. Uh, the, we met on uh, a date in the 20s in August <laughs> on a Friday afternoon, and we talked about the strategic planning update, Dr. Homan and uh, Dr. Anderson came and uh, we also talked um, in a sort of preemptive conversation about the fall 2023 plans at AHS as well as planned out our meetings and uh, schedule with the support of Dr. McNeil through the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. Facilities, uh, Mr. Thuman. The subcommittee meets next 15th at, uh, I think it's Wednesday. Yeah, uh, well, I'm sorry, the 14th at 5 p.m. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, in addition to the uh, motions that we made under the uh, policies agenda item, we had a brief discussion on file JC, assignment of students to schools. Superintendent brought that up as a preliminary <coughs> discussion of something that we should be thinking about going forward. Uh, she thinks it would be helpful to ask families who are attending school under open enrollment to indicate their desire to maintain the open enroll school on an annual basis. So that it's just not, 
where we're not looking to move people out, but to have some sort of a statement that says, yes, I understand that I'm an open enrollment and I do want to stay in my out of uh, district, out of zone placement. Um, the, the question that she had for us as well is that historically we haven't done a really good job of tracking this in power school and that uh, once we have the uh, buffer zone report and she'll also do some investigation into who's open enrolled and how many people are moving around under the program that we'll have data to have a conversation about this and uh, to consider any tweaks to the current policy. But that's just sort of a heads up of something that sort of November-ish, December-ish we might be looking at. Thank you. High School Building Committee, Minister Thielman. We had a good conversation about it right now. <laughs> no further report. We're trying to reschedule our, our, our meeting because of a conflict with the Jewish holiday. Um, and then uh, Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee, which was created uh, at our special meeting this summer. Mr. Looking Carter. to schedule a meeting shortly. Thanks. Uh, liaison reports. Uh, announcements. Future agenda items. Okay. I, I had one question about the um, the uh, direction on public comment. So I could, it was rewritten. So the expectation now that if people want to give public comment that they have to sign up before three o'clock, even if they come in person. Yeah. Okay. Which is definitely different than our past yes. practice. So that um, it's posted on the agenda. Mm -hmm. It is posted in two places on our website. Um, and I will read that at the beginning of, of each meeting. The meetings are hybrid now. So it, the, the piece of it being past practice mm -hmm. is tricky because we have like, they were fully in person, then they were fully remote and now, and now they're hybrid. So it's not consistent though with the way the select board does it either. Cause they just, they have people sign, sign up. So show up. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think that the policy, I think, says that it's at the discretion of the chair, so that's fine. Um, maybe we can have a conversation with the next chair on how we do that. I don't know. I, yeah. And if we don't like the policy, we can change it. Um, okay. Um, executive session. Um, let's see. So I'm looking for a motion to go into executive session um, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declare. Um, related to AEA unit D monotomy preschool TA's grievance. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Slickman, second by Mr. Hainer. Um, roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. We are now in executive session and we are not coming back into open session. Thank you. 